Hi, so I want to say a little, little bit about what the gene morphology is, what gene morphology is all about, just to get us started thinking about the, the basics, the fundamentals, the building blocks of gene morphology, before we then go on and look at some specific case studies, some specific ex examples to get you into the, uh, the subject in a bit more detail. So gene morphology, according to this definition, as you can imagine, it's got my name on it, so I like this one. According to this defini definition, gene morphology is a study of landforms, landscapes and the processes that create them. Now that's my definition, I think it's okay. You need your own definition, you need to be able to explain to somebody else what you think geomorphology is and how you think geomorphology is different from the rest of physical geography or how it differs from geology or what part of geology or geography it really is. By doing some reading and by thinking about the things we cover in these sessions, make sure by the end of this week, next week, you have a good definition of geomorphology uh, of your own. Now, you'll see there are lots of definitions in the textbooks and in the literature. I'm sure you can Google it and find lots of examples for yourself. Some of them are very straightforward, very short. The definition uh, given by Huggett in the textbook that we're recommending for these, uh, these sessions. Geomorphology is the study of landforms and the processes that create them, very much like my own. I threw landscapes in there as well. Hugg Huggett doesn't have that in there. Uh, you can make your own decision as to whether you like that or not. Other definitions, there's one there from uh, Ritter in one of, one of the older textbooks, goes into much more detail and includes information about the history of the discipline and the context of the discipline uh, relative to other areas of, of study. You want to be able to give a quick definition, you also want that more nuanced or, or detailed definition as, as well under your belt. So make sure you do a little bit of reading, a little bit of thinking uh, and come up with a definition uh, that works for you. As you're starting to develop your definitions, you'll encounter lots of material about geomorphology that quickly, I'm sure, will make you realize there's more than one kind of geomorphology. It's all very well to come up with a simple definition, but there are lots of different ways of doing this subject and there are lots of different things that you can use this subject for. Nowadays, most geomorphologists would define themselves probably as, as what we call process geomorphologists. In other words, we very much nowadays think of geomorphology as being to do, as with that definition I gave you at the beginning, to do with the relationship between the processes that are going on in the environment, erosion, transport, deposition, and the landforms that result from those processes. That linking together of process and form pretty much to most of us today seems obvious, but a hundred years ago that wasn't necessarily an obvious way of looking at the discipline. So it's pretty much a, a, a present day, a current way of thinking about geomorphology. At various points in the past, people have thought about geomorphology in, in different ways. My immediate predecessor in my, my job, I was, I was officially appointed as a lecturer in geomorphology at Kiel. And the last permanent lecturer in geomorphology before me wrote a book called Climatic Geomorphology. And climatic geomorphology is the idea that it's climate that controls the landforms in, in an area. We'd say, well, yeah, there's, there's an, an element of that because climate controls process and process controls landform. But we've moved away a little bit from that, di that direct climate form link. Other people, particularly in the past, but it's still valid now for some, for some issues, people can approach geomorphology from a historical perspective, thinking about um, how landscapes evolve over time and looking at that historical development of landscape as being the heart of the discipline. Another focus that people often take, and this is the way that I was actually brought up when I, when I first start, started studying geomorphology, uh, one of my textbooks was called Rocks and Relief. And the idea was that the nature of the rocks, the nature of the, uh, the geology, was the primary control on the nature of the landforms that would arise in any particular area. Uh, so structural geomorphology is very much a geologist's geomorphology. And there are lots of others, there are lots of different ways of approaching the discipline. I would argue that at any point in history, the best thing to do would be to combine these and to choose the best elements of each for the particular problem or the particular landform or landscape that you're studying. But what you need to do at this stage, and this is, this is basically your homework for um, th this first session, is to get into the extra reading, go and have a look at the, the, the core textbook and, and other sources that you can find, and just find out a little bit about each of these different approaches to geomorphology and try to build them in somehow into your own definition uh, of the subject. 
Now, we're talking about this in the context of land systems. So where, where, do, where does land systems fit in with geomorphology? Where does geomorphology sit, sit in with land systems? Well, a land systems approach is basically a slightly broader context on that same issue. We're still thinking about the landforms, the landscapes, the processes, but we're also thinking a little bit more explicitly about the environmental controls and the materials. That's a, that's a big angle of the land systems approach, is that we're not only looking at the processes and the outcomes of those processes, but we're looking at the materials materials that are affected by and that are produced by um, the, those processes and that are part of those landforms and we're incorporating the materials, the soils, the sediments and you could argue also incorporating uh, the bio side of things also into that bigger systems approach looking at the whole, uh, the whole landform, the whole landscape, it's a more holistic approach. And the kind of idea here is that we, well, I'm going to argue in, in these sessions that the characteristics of the environment determines the nature of the energy which is being applied to the Earth's surface. That energy affects the materials to drive processes. This interaction of energy and materials driving processes is what creates landforms and assemblages of landforms, well that's what makes up a landscape. So our geomorphology, our processes acting on materials to give us landforms, sits right at the heart of this land systems approach. And that's why we're putting geomorphology uh, right at the front uh, of, of, these, uh, of these sessions for you. So for us, one of the key issues to think about is thinking about it from the point of view of how landscapes are created. And I'm arguing that physical environmental controls, such as climate, for example, such as the energy impacting on the Earth's surface, those drive geomorphic processes, erosion, transport, deposition, entrainment, weathering. And those processes create, control, develop emerging landforms at the Earth's surface. So we see the arrows going down the page here uh, as we're creating landscapes. The second issue that we can think about as geomorphologists is how we read the landscape. And basically, you can see what I've done here is just reverse those two arrows and say, well, we read a landscape by looking at the landforms, inferring from those landforms what processes must have been going on to have created those landforms and then inferring once we know what processes are going on what must have been going on in the in the wider environment what kind of environmental controls must have been in play in order for those processes to be happening so once we understand what it is that leads to landforms and landscapes then we can read landforms and landscapes to work back up this diagram and figure out what the environment was like at the point when those processes were going on and when these landscapes were therefore being created so geomorphology is very much like detective work. We have questions where we're trying to work things out. What caused this? What will happen if we do this? What will happen if there's more rain or, or climate changes? Where would you find these resources? Where would I go to get the right kind of sand or a particular kind of uh, soil? And how can we prevent floods, landslides, etc.? These, these are questions that we can try to find answers to by research, and that's at the heart of, uh, the, heart of the discipline. And a lot of those questions are applied questions. They relate to things useful to people, getting hold of resources, dealing with hazards and so on. So we talk of geomorphology as an applied discipline. And applied geomorphology is an important part of what we're going to be looking at uh, in, these, uh, in these sessions. But I, I keep emphasising, and you saw this on, on the introductory video, that as well as worrying about the little details of, of exactly how, how things are going on, don't forget the big picture, don't forget the reason that we're really interested in geomorphology. For, for most of us, it begins with this idea of amazing landscapes, puzzling landscapes, yes, with, with questions attached to them, but landscapes that inspire us, that motivate us to want to get answers to those questions, to find things out uh, about the landscapes. But remember, those interesting landscapes don't have to be remote and far away. You can do geomorphology on your doorstep, wherever you are. This is a drone image of uh, Kiel campus, thanks to Alex for, for, the, for this picture. Kiel itself seems like a boring middle of England landscape, nothing spectacular there, you might think. 
rubbish. We're right on the national drainage divide. We're in an area that's been affected by glaciers. You can still see the glacial sediments all around the area. There were huge meltwater channels carved through this district by meltwater coming off the edge of the last British ice sheet 20,000 years ago. Since then, more things have been happening in the landscape and the landscape is still changing. There's lots going on and lots to see. Wherever you are, you might be on Kiel campus right now, or maybe you're living away from Kiel. Wherever you are, you won't have to go far to find some geomorphology to look at, to ask questions about. And if you're saying, oh no, it's all boring and flat around me, well that's geomorphology. You don't have to have big hills and huge valleys and thundering rivers. Whatever your land surface is like, that is the geomorphology and there's a reason for it. And one of the things I'm going to be asking you to do later on in these sessions is to have a look around you in your local area and just begin to ask some questions and maybe even get some answers about why your landscape, your local landscape, looks the way it does. Now one key point associated with that is that once we understand the big rules of geomorphology, those same rules apply everywhere. Now, there will be differences from place to place in the landforms that emerge and what processes are going on and so, so, so on, because of differences in the interrelationships between the controlling factors. But the basic ideas, the building blocks, if you like, are going to be the same wherever you are. You don't have to learn different geomorphology rules in order to look at geomorphology in different landscapes. So when I finish talking, maybe come back and have another look at this slide just to make sure that you can see how all this ties together. But these are the building blocks of the geomorphology that we're going to be talking about. We're interested in processes, erosion, etc. Those processes are carried out by agents such as wind, water, glacier ice, and those agents are carrying out work. They can only do that because they have energy. It might be energy ultimately derived from the sun or from gravity or from Earth's interior energy, but that energy affects materials. So you need those materials and the properties of those materials make a difference to the landforms that are being created just as the nature of the energy makes a difference. So the details of specific landforms can be attributed to that relationship between energy varying from place to place and materials varying from place to place and the processes that link them together. So environmental conditions such as temperature, they affect the properties of the materials that we're talking about and therefore they also affect the operation of these processes that we're talking about. So you have in there with environmental conditions, processes, energy, materials, landforms, those are the building blocks, those are the key starting points that we need to understand and see the links between in order to get a grip on what geomorphology is all about. Now, if you did geography at Kiel in first year, then you'll have notes from Fundamentals of Physical Geography and the Practice of Physical Geography. Go back and have a look at those at this stage because that is a relevant background uh, to what we're doing in this module as well. So revisit those notes and just make sure you understand some of the basic concepts from there. If there are things in there that we did before that you don't understand, or if you haven't done that before and you can't quickly look up those, those items that I've listed there uh, in the textbook, let me know if there are things that you want me to go through in more detail later in these sessions. I can make time to do that uh, easily enough. So just let me know if there are particular things that you want me to go over uh, in more detail. So we can identify from everything we've said so far two big issues that keep coming up or over and over again already. We haven't even got very far and these, these issues keep coming up energy, the driving forces that are making things happen in the landscape, and the way that materials respond to those, and that depends on the properties of those different materials. And as I just mentioned, those material properties are to some extent controlled by environmental uh, conditions. So that's what we're going to begin by looking at uh, in the rest of this, uh, this session and moving into the next session. Energy inputs and the way that materials respond to those energy inputs. A very well-known example of the way in which we can think about processes and landforms in terms of this relationship between energy and work or load or the impact on materials uh, is this graph, which is what we call a Hullstrom curve. You've probably seen this before, but if not, you'll easy, easily find it in, in the literature to, to read up on. It basically shows us for a variety of different particle sizes from the very fine grain down here 
up through bigger and bigger one millimeter, 10 millimeter, bigger and bigger particles up to boulders on the right hand side. What's happening to those particles in flowing water, so imagine we're in a river where the water is moving very slowly or not quite so slowly or a little bit more quickly or really quite quickly, 10 meters per second at the top. What it shows is that for any particular particle size, so take the 0.1 millimeter particle size here, if the water is moving very slowly at the bottom of the diagram here, then if it's in transport, it's, the, the sediment is going to drop out of transport. It's, it's below the fall velocity, and so we're in a deposition zone here. The water is not going quickly enough to keep this stuff in transport. If the water is going a little bit more quickly, then if material is already in transport, so if you've thrown some grains of silt in there, um, they'll stay in transport. The water is going fast enough, it has enough energy to keep st the stuff moving. If it isn't in transport already, if it's sat on the bed, it won't pick it up yet. And in order to entrain material or to erode the bed, we need velocities up at this level to entrain and erode material of this kind of size. So as you increase the energy in the flowing water, faster and faster water, you can entrain and transport particles more effectively. For any given um, flow velocity on this graph, you can also work across and say, well, what's happening at any particular flow velocity? What's happening to different size particles at that velocity? I'll let you take some time on your own to just have a think through that graph and make sure you can understand it. Um, but it is an important illustration, a very well-known illustration of the fact that this relationship between energy and load underpins the processes that are going on uh, in a lot of ge geomorphic in, in a lot of geomorphic environments. And here's a, another illustration of that that maybe is easy to quickly get your head around. This is just an example of differential erosion at Lulwood Cove on the south coast of England in Dorset. And the geological map here shows that you've got bands of different types of rock uh, at the surface close to the coast. Here's the sea down here. Uh, here's the, the land up here. And this pale blue band here is a band of uh, harder rock, just to, keep, to simplify. Once that band of harder rock has been broken through in that location and in that location, the rocks that are then exposed to the sea are more erodible uh, rocks, rocks which are easier to wear away. So once that defensive line of blue rock is broken, then we get much more substantial erosion occurring behind that band. And you can see here in the, um, the aerial image and the, um, the, the air photo here, you can see the shape of the landform which is emerging there where this band of protective rock is broken through. And you can see here that band of resistant rock as well as protecting the, the land behind it also makes a bit of a ridge there compared with the softer, more erodible rock behind that the sea has now eaten its way into and, and, and is eroding away behind there. So this is actually a nice example of well, what kind of geomorphology is this? Remember, is this climatic geomorphology? Is it process geomorphology? Kind of. And it's structural geomorphology, kind of, because we're, we're very much relating here to the, um, the geology underneath the, la the landforms as being primary controls on the nature of the landforms. But they're being that, the geology is being that control because of its impact on the processes that are going on. And you'll find lots of examples in the literature of landforms that are related to the nature of uh, the energy, the materials and the processes. Consider an alluvial fan, for example. This is an, an example from Svalbard. Uh, water flowing out of the hills hits the flatter ground, loses energy and deposits material. And it's that loss of energy as the gradient of the stream decreases that results in the, the deposition of the sediment to create the, the fan. And as the streams spread out and divide and anastomose, so here you've got a single channel splitting into many channels, then each of those channels again splits up into many smaller channels. As we get the smaller and smaller channels, they can carry only finer and finer sediment. So in this kind of setting, you'd expect the biggest boulders, the largest grades of sediment can only be carried where you have the single thread of channel. And as soon as you, you split the channel, you'll, the bigger boulders will be deposited up here. And as we move down towards the edge of an alluvial fan, you get finer and finer grained uh, sediment being, being carried and ultimately deposited because the coarser grained stuff was only able to be transported while you had the, the bigger streams up at the top of the fan. So the distribution of sediment through an alluvial fan, and that's something you can go away and read up a little bit about if you, if you want, 
The distribution of sediment through that fan is controlled by the distribution of available energy, controlled by uh, the distribution of the stream channels on top of the fan. And that idea of there being a geography of energy availability, you can trace through all sorts of different um, case study examples uh, throughout geomorphology. And that's one of the reasons that geomorphology is a geographical subject. You might be thinking, well, why are we doing geomorphology as part of geography? Well, what is that? Well, the geography in geomorphology is that the controlling factors are geographically variable. Things are different from place to place, the energy, the materials, everything else, and it's that geographical difference which leads to the geographical differences in landforms not only between different locations but even within an individual landform. So you can already see a variety of recurring themes coming back over and over again and these are obviously the things that we need to look at, look at in, in these sessions. So we've talked about energy supply, we've talked about the applied force, the resistance to that force, force, things happening, strain, movement uh, as a result of that interaction between stress uh, and strength. We've talked, not explicitly but by, by implication, we've talked about boundaries between where things happen and where things don't happen. That's what the Hulstrom curve is all about. And that has implications for sensitivity, how delicate is the balance in a particular landfall or, or, or landscape. So at this stage it's becoming clear that to understand landforms better we now need to look at how materials respond to applied force, to energy, to stress, to what it is that generates that stress, what, where does that force, where does that energy come from and what is it that controls the responses of material to those forces. That's what geomorphology is all about and that's what we're going to look at in more detail over the next few sessions uh, and look at some examples of particular environments and particular landforms as well. If you have any questions get in touch.